Okay, tonight we are lucky enough to have Kate Leonard speaking to us. Uh, Kate Leonard is a longtime orchid hobbyist who enjoys growing many different kinds of orchids with her husband, Ian Sanderson, on Pacific Heights in Honolulu. Kate serves as third vice president on the HOS Board of Trustees. She's a probationary judge with the Honolulu Orchid Society and a student judge with the American Orchid Society. During work hours, Kate serves as a judge on the Intermediate Court of Appeals for the state of Hawaii. And tonight we'll be hearing her speak on various awarded white Cattleya hybrids uh, that she has studied for the last several months uh, rather in depth. So thank you, Kate. Thank you. So there's gotta be a way to sh share my screen here. Is it, I just press the button, uh, Adam. Oh, wait. Brad, yeah, we gotta make you co-host. Go ahead and make that possible. Okay, you should be ready. Now you should be good. Okay. Let's see. All right. Let me get rid of this. Okay. Can you see my slide there? Yes. Okay. All right, well, good evening, everyone. Um, I am Kate Leonard, and my talk this evening is entitled A Brief Study of Award-Winning White Cattleyas. Um, what I noticed when uh, Brad and I did our, uh, our dry run to, to see how the technology worked is it works better uh, on, for some of my slides if you minimize uh, the everybody's pictures because otherwise you're you're gonna miss some cool stuff in the corner. Okay, so my earliest memories of an orchid is the white cat Leia corsage my grandmother loved to wear to church on Easter Sunday. I recall that the flowers were big and showy and worn with a pin almost the size of a knitting needle. White cattleyas are also an important part of my own orchid journey. The first time I saw a live orchid plant was in February of 1979. I was taking a horticultural botany class and our professor took us on a field trip down to Orchids by Hauserman in Illinois. I will never forget the experience of walking into a large greenhouse in the dead of winter with row after row of 10 inch pots of Cattleya Bobbett's white lightning, many of them in bloom. It was love at first sight and it quite literally changed my life. Four years later, I was on a plane to Hawaii. My first job here was at H&R Nurseries when it was primarily a tissue culture and flasking lab. In addition, in 2019, the American Orchid Society conducted a very nice webinar on white cattleyas by AOS judge, Jean Allen Ickeson. In viewing that talk, I was reminded that as an orchid judge, I needed to consider white cattleyas from a different perspective than that awestruck 19 year old stomping snow off her boots. My presentation this evening was initially developed as a presentation to Hawaii AOS judges. I've changed it up a little bit for those of you who may have seen it before. Okay, so this is Cattleya Johnette Bowers Odom's Orchids, a lovely white Cattleya that was awarded by the American Orchid Society in 2016. Both AOS and HOS use a point scale when they judge orchids. AOS has three merit awards an HCC or highly commended certificate for flowers scoring from 75 to 79, an AM or award of merit for flowers scoring from 80 to 89, and the highest merit award, an FCC or first class certificate for plants scoring 90 and above. HOS has similar but not identical tiers in its judging system. I also think it's helpful to be clear about what we define as a white cattleya. A pure white orchid does not have the slightest trace of purple pigment, either in the flower or the plant. Green and yellow plastids are present 
And a white flower often has yellow markings in the throat, but the flower must not otherwise be tinged with color. There are many pale whitish cattleyas that are essentially dilute color forms. They may be lovely, even award-winning, but perhaps not as white cattleyas. Early breeders of white cattleyas were surprised to find that breeding two white cattleyas often led to offspring with mostly purple or even all purple flowers. Scientists have learned that manifestation of color in cattleyas depends on at least two sets of genes working together to create the appearance of colored flowers or white flowers. Most white cattleya species fall into one of two groups, which will consistently breed white within the group, but will display color if bred with the other group. I also want to note that the inheritance of lip color, this part of the plant, is controlled separately from the petals and sepals, which is how we get semi-albas, which are white flowers with a purple, pink, or red lip. And I suppose you all know, and it's, uh, but I'll, I'll talk about these flower parts over and over, so I might as well um, point them out maybe for new members. This is the dorsal sepal up here of the flower. These are lateral sepals down here. When your flower bud is closed, those are the outermost parts. These are the petals, these beautiful wide petals here. This is the lip or the labellum of your cattleya. And right there poking out of the lip is the column. The column is, holds the reproductive organs of your orchid. And right there, you can kind of see the the, the tip of the, the column where the pollinia or male flower parts are underneath that cap. And behind there is the stigma, which is the female reproductive organ of, uh, of the cattleya and other orchids. Okay, so when I started thinking about this talk, I was gonna take out any discussion about the judging process. But I can distinctly remember wondering, why do orchid judges give an award to one beautiful plant, but not another one that looks equally beautiful to me? And the answer is that for both HOS judging and AOS judging, the purpose of judging flower quality is to recognize superiority and improvement in orchid flowers. In scoring flowers, orchid judges consider three principles the hypothetical standard of perfection, the qualities and merits of previously awarded plants of comparable type, breeding, or characteristics, and whether any qualities or characteristic represents an advancement over comparable plants. In judging cattleyas, including white cattleyas, the general form is towards fullness and roundness. The flower, should fill most of the area of a circle with the base of the column at the center. And the circle should touch the tips of the petals, the sepals and the margin of the lip. The sepals should be broad and fill in the gap between the petals and the lip. And the petals should be erect to slightly arched, broad and rounded, frilled or undulated at the margins the lip should be proportionate to the petals with a rounded, flattened, flattened, symmetrical, and crisp or frilled trumpet. It should be closed towards the base usually, and that's the ba base of the lip there, and sort of rolled around the column. Now, hybrids with wrinkolalia tend to have lips that are larger than the petals, and lip to petal ratio varies with ancestries. Flowers should be nearly flat when viewed from the side with the lip curving down. Color should be clear, bright, strong, and evenly dispersed. The lips should blend or contrast pleasingly. Size should be equal or greater to the geometric mean of its parents. Substance of a high degree is now standard. Texture should be sparkling, crystalline, velvety, or waxy. Now, floriferousness stems from the parentage, but 
Laviette type cattleyas like the ones I'm featuring tonight, they should usually have two or more flowers to be judged. In bifoliate cattleya crosses, the size of the flowers and the width of the petals will of course be less than in pure labiata type crosses, but there should generally be several flowers to be judged. The stem should be strong and upright and flowers should not crowd or distort one another. Let's see, where's my... Okay, so the two cultivars mentioned above aptly demonstrate many of the facets of judging white cattleyas. But I wanna really preface my remarks by noting two things. First, the picture on the left is a snapshot taken by a hobbyist in the UK to share with friends, whereas the picture on the right is an AOS award photograph. And second, Bob Betts was registered in 1950 and has received 66 AOS awards for flower quality, mostly in the 50s and 60s, the heyday of fantastic white cattleyas. Now, white lightning is not an awarded cultivar, but it certainly had a lot of competition. John Ed Bowers, on the other hand, was registered in 1995 and has received only one merit award to date in 2016. Nevertheless, there's a lot to see here. The flower on the right immediately attracts us with its fullness and its roundness. You can easily picture the overlaying circle, touching the tips of the petals and sepals with the lip, perhaps a tad small in proportion to the extra wide petals, but we're not looking at a Brasso cattleya or what's now known as a Rinkolelio cattleya. The sepals you can see are nicely broad and flat and they fill much of the gap between the petals and the lip. The petals are erect with a slight arch, beautifully broad and round, and they appear to be relatively flat. The lip is closed at the base and curls nicely around the column. It has a pleasing downward curve. The frontal plane of the lip is slightly oval. The whiteness appears to be even and bright. The yellow markings in the lip are distinctive and pleasing. And the award description describes the substance as heavy and the texture is matte. By contrast, the Bob Betts white lightning doesn't strike one as full and round, although I suspect that any of us would be happy to find this blooming on their bench. The photograph doesn't help, but we struggle to overlay the circle here. The sepals are more narrow, tapered and curling. The petals are not particularly rounded and they seem to flop in every direction. The lip is long and pronouncedly trumpeted. The color in the throat is nice. The general color, especially in the petals is crisp and white and even in this snapshot, the texture is, appears to be sparkling and crystalline. I recall these are big flowers on a big plant. Um, and the owner of this plant reports that the flowers are 16.5 centimeters wide and 19 centimeters high. He thinks for various reasons, it'll bloom better in the future, but based on its current form, its lack of balance, symmetry and harmony, and that of comparable plants, I don't believe that orchid judges would necessarily select this one to be awarded at this time. Now, you cannot study award-winning white cattleyas, even briefly, without considering cattleya bow bells, which is perhaps the most famous standard white cattleya of all time. Bow bells was registered in 1945. Before bow bells came along, there was reportedly little improvement over wild collected forms notwithstanding seven generations and thousands of white cat hybrids. A large group of unflowered seedlings had been brought to the US by Clint McDade of Rivermont Orchids, a Tennessee nursery during World War II. In 1945, five of these plants were brought to an AOS trustees meeting. One, Cattleya Bow Bell's Purity, was awarded an FCC. 
the highest award given in either the AOS or HOS judging system, and the whole group received a rare civil, silver medal of excellence from the American Orchid Society. Arthur Chadwick reports that four of the five were first bloom seedlings. They were consistently vigorous plants with superior qualities, including good substance, wide petals, and sepals with good flat form and carriage, and a large white lip with a ruffled edge. Bow bells next appeared at the 1948 Miami Orchid Show, where two more were awarded FCCs, including the cultivar pictured here on the left. In a 2004 book, Professor Courtney Hackney states that all of the Cattleya bow bells ever awarded are from the original strain that came over from England and the sibs and selfings that quickly followed. Dozens of bow bells clones were awarded in the 40s and 50s and 60s. And then after more than a 45 year pause, bow bells was again awarded this time on the big island of Hawaii. I asked the awardee, Matthias Silas, who's here with us tonight uh, from Shogun Orchids, how it was his bow bells got awarded after all this time. And I asked him whether he thought his plant stemmed from a sib cross or a selfing from that original transatlantic batch of seedlings. He said he wasn't sure, but what he also said kind of blew me away because he said that there were still many, many fine bow bells out there that have never been shown to judges. In fact, he has a few of them himself. Now this plant you see here was not from his own hybridizing program. AOS records of the measurements from the FCC plants of the 40s are lost to time. But Matthias's plant weighed in at a natural spread of 18.8 centimeters horizontally and 18 centimeters vertically at the time of judging. That's about 7.4 inches across. Now, as an aside, even the name of this orchid has quite a history. There's a church in London named St. Mary Le Beau. It is one of the oldest, largest, and historically most important churches in England. Originally built in about 1080, it was destroyed in the Great Fire of London in 1666 and then rebuilt. For hundreds of years, Londoners who identified themselves as Cockney are said to be born within the sound of bow bells. The bow bells fell silent in June of 1940 as the British prepared to be invaded by the Nazis. The bells were destroyed in 1941 in blitz bombing of London and not replaced until 1961. McDade, who also had a nursery in England at that time, named this cross in honor of the bow bells. Bow bells has been described as the backbone for many, if not most, awarded white cats that followed. The Cattleya edithii that was used in the original Grex was White Empress. Preeminent hybridizer B. O. Bracey of Armacost and Royston and others had divisions of this clone in their stud house, but they were unable to produce the same incredible results as McDade's original batch of bow bell seedlings from England. I read that the original White Empress might have been a tetraploid that then reverted to a normal diploid state, but it remained an important breeder nonetheless. However, it is, C, it is the Cattleya Suzanne High that has been described as the most talked about Cattleya of all times. Some of you know this story, but during World War II, Black and Flory shipped their best stud plants from the UK to the US to save them from destruction. And the ship carrying the Suzanne High was sunk by a German submarine. The results of the original Bow Bells cross were never repeated. Selfings and Sib crosses were, however, very successful. The clone Honolulu 
was a tetraploid that was reportedly the first Cattleya ever cloned, as well as the ancestry of many great white hybrids. It has never been awarded. Matthias has one that he showed me over FaceTime and it has a lovely form, but uh, he said it's perhaps not as large as some of the other Bobels. Now looking at this family tree here a little more granularly, we can see that Bobels has a rather simple pedigree and is made up of only three species. 75% of its gene pool comes from a combination of Cattleya gaskeliana and Cattleya mossiae, 37% each, and 25% from Cattleya trianii. Now, mossiae is known to have three, even four large flowers per stem, but it has a tendency for the petals to fall forward, not a trait favored by orchid judges. And it tends, but it does have a broad flattened lip in many cases. I understand that there is a lot of variability as to the form in the species. Now the albinistic form is called Cattleya mossiae variety wagoneri, which I will return to briefly in just a minute. Cattleya gaskeliana is challenged by a relatively poor form with a rather with rather narrow petals and sepals, but its lip is fairly large and frilly. Flowers are good sized with heavy substance. And the addition of Cattleya trianii helps produce round flowers with large petals that can last as long as a month, a very nice trait. The lip tends not to be as broad or spreading as some of the other labiatas, and the size is reportedly a bit smaller than Gascaliana and Mossiae, but it can carry three to five flowers per stem. Perhaps the most widely used alba form was Broomhills, which received an FCC from the Royal Horticultural Society in England and has been described as the benchmark for this species. In addition to the 50 merit awards uh, the American Orchid Society has given Bow Bells itself, it has over 4,600 progeny, which have received nearly 2,000 awards, not all of which are white, of course, but the list includes many well-known and awarded crosses, including Bob Betts, Empress Bells, General Patton, Es Betts, Donna Kimura, Hawaiian Wedding Song, Burdekin Wonder, Ranger Six, Ruth G, and Princess Bells, just to name a few. When I first was preparing this talk, I learned that a division of purity, the first Bow Bells to receive an FCC, still exists. Here we have a picture of a division of that original Cattleya Bow Bells purity that it was awarded the FCC in 1945. The owner, Jeff Bradley of Houston, Texas, reports that all of the Bow Bells cultivar, of all the Bow Bells cultivars, purity has the largest flowers and is the rarest. Um, he told me that any plants remaining in any collection today came from, of purity that is, came from his collection. Other important white cats of the 1940s included Cattleya Joyce Hannington, which was registered in 1945 by a private collector named Ernest Blaney Dane and awarded an FCC in 1947. That's this uh, black and white photo up here. I'm sure it had a yellow lip. Um, people said it looked like Bow Bells and it had a quarter Suzanne High in its background, but its parentage was dominated by another species, Cattleya labiata, the albiform, which helps produce well-arranged flowers on strong upright stems. Its descendants have been awarded over a hundred times. Now, Ernest Blaney Dane was a fabulously wealthy industrialist with a world renowned orchid collection tended to by skilled horticulturalists, including one Mr. Hannington. Hannington named the flower after his daughter Joyce and registered the name without first consulting Ernest Blaney Dane. When Dane found out, he immediately fired Hannington, who never got another job growing orchids. Cattleya Henrietta Jaffet 
was also registered by Clint McDade, the originator of Bow Bells, in 1946. Its most famous clone picture pictured here is Lines, receiving a high scoring award from the AOS in 1951. But its real claim to fame is that the Henrietta Jaffet became the standard bearer for the cut flower industry and every flower of this type became known as a Jaffet. Bringing bifoliate cattleyas into the standard white cattleyas brought down the size, increased the flower count, gave the flowers heavy texture, a nice flat form and strong erect stems. Although this plant received a high AM, I get the impression that the commercial popularity of the Jaffets led to a bit of disdain. Rincolelio Catlea Deus, registered in 1947 by Vaccaro and Lecouf in France, was also considered a breakthrough in Catlea breeding, bringing the large frilly lip of Brassavola, now Rincolelio Catlea, into the white Catleas and producing renowned offspring such as Rincolelio Pastoral Innocence. Rincolelio Mount Hood Mary, and Rincolelio Catlea Mount Anderson, which is Bowbells crossed with Deas. It is reported that French lace has a trait that is expressed in its progeny, which is the appearance of a little lavender patch on the lip in alternating years. Now, I return to Bob Betts for just another moment. Bob Betts was registered in 1950, five years after Bow Bells by the same grower, Clint McDade of Rivermont Orchids. The pod parent was Bow Bells Honolulu and the official orchid registries list the pollen parent of Bob Betts as Cattleya mossiae variety Wageneri. But that pollen parent was apparently a jungle collected plant that had been variously labeled as Cattleya speciosima snow queen, FCCAOS, or Cattleya ludemanniana, the queen, FCCAOS. When it flowered for McDade, he knew that it had not been correctly identified. He changed the name to Cattleya mossiae variety Wageneri snow queen because the growth habit resembled mossiae, even though the flower apparently didn't look exactly like a mossiae. That clone reportedly still existed at least as of the early 2000s. And it was confirmed as a natural hybrid between Cattleya mossiae and Cattleya ludemanniana, which occur over the same range in nature. This natural hybrid is known as Cattleya gravesiana. Now, remakes of Bob Betts with Mossiae have been noted as failures, but selfings and sibings, sib crosses from the original seedlings have been very successful and widely distributed. Cattleya Bob Betts is the most highly awarded of all Bull Bell's progeny with 66 merit awards, including two FCCs for the Virgin and Sistina. Most of these awards were given in the 50s and 60s with only two in the early 70s. And I can tell you from looking at a lot of pictures of Bob Betts, it seems there's a high degree of variability between individual plants of any given clone. For example, these are all Cattleya Bob Betts white lightning, but the column and lip in David Harrop's plants looks much more elongated and the dorsal sepal is notably more spoonly than the plant below it. The yellow markings in the lip of the Hauserman's plant to the right appear to extend much further to the margins of the lip than the one to its left. I also looked at various pictures of York, an awarded clone of Bob Betts, which also showed a lot of variation. This is just a reminder that culture, environment, presentation, and other factors play a big role in what ends up getting awarded.
Now, there are many fine white cat layers that followed Bo Bells and Bob Betts, and I could not study and present them all. So I simply picked two. Cattleya Angel Bells caught my eye because it was registered in 1960, 10 years after Bob Betts. And I imagine it representing an attempt to incorporate a positive new influence into the regal line of Bow Bells Whites. The pod parent, Empress Bells, has as blue blooded a pedigree as possible, a cross between Bow Bells and its pod parent, Edithii. The pollen parent was the different one. Catlea Little Angel is a bifoliate with 75% plus loaded GZI in its makeup. I say plus because the not loaded GZI ancestor was Extalosa, the natural hybrid between loaded GZI and Wakariana. You know, I sort of imagine a few noses wrinkling when it hit the judging table in 1966. What's this? Kind of small, eh? Yet there's something perky and attractive about the compact flattened form and the uplifting petals, the pleasing lip, glistening, glistening texture and firm substance and the strong stems displaying the flowers well above the foliage. I imagine the judges saying, kind of nice, let's judge it. I think of this line of Calais as the revenge of the Japhets. The other white I've chosen to represent these middle ages of awarded white Cattleyas is Cattleya Ruth G. Cattleya Ruth G demonstrates the enduring strength of line breeding from Cattleya Bow Bells. Registered in 1975, Ruth G produced 10 merit awarded clones, including one FCC in 1983 demonstrating a consistency between clones that has been described as almost species-like, certainly Bow Bells-like. Its ancestry includes seven doses of Suzanne High through excellent parents, as Betts and Old Whitey. It produced a number of offsprings, including Ben Kodama's lovely but unawarded Catlea Hawaiian Snowflake in 1989. But it's hard to say this line of breeding, breeding could be further improved a core consideration for orchid judging. I also wanted to see which white catlays have been judged most recently. So I reviewed the last two and then the last three years of AOS's Orchids magazine. This was a bad plan because there was a lot to look at. I was really looking for pure white labia type hybrids but they were few and far between. Cattleya Mishima Pearl is simply a classic white Cattleya. It's beautiful. It's Cattleya Old Whitey crossed with Tiffin Bells. Bow Bells is both a grandparent and a great grandparent. And if you go back five generations, Cattleya Suzanne High appears eight times. This cross was registered in 2003 and awarded only one AM in 2017. I was surprised to find that Ben Kodama's Catlea Hawaiian Wedding Song Virgin was awarded a 79 point HCC in 2017, as I thought it already had one. Turns out it was previously awarded at 77 points in 1992. This is, of course, the, cat, the cross between Catlea Angel Bells, which we just looked at, and Catlea Clasiana a primary hybrid between Cattleya Intermedia and Cattleya Lodigesii. This line of breeding has injected big doses of the smaller bifoliate white cats, Lodigesii and Intermedia, into the old lines. Of course, in Angel Bells, we find Bow Bells a couple generations back with Suzanne High showing up three times in the lineage. I don't think that moved. Okay, so like Cattleya Mishima Pearl, Cattleya Sega Pile is a one hit wonder. It was registered in 1974 and not awarded until it received this AM in 2018. This cross is notable perhaps because it does not have the usual suspects in its background. No Bow Bells, no Suzanne High. 
but nearly 30% of its genes come from Cattleya mossiae with 25% from Morzowitzii plus five other species. Now, I probably shouldn't have included the DAS here because the award description notes a faint pink overlay on the dorsal sepal. But DAS is a lovely and important old white originated in 1947. And I was kind of glad to see it here with its open and frilly brasso lip firm and erect petals and crystalline texture, it's easy to see why Deus has been used as a parent at least 172 times with nearly 3,000 progeny, including many that surpass it in form, color, and overall quality, yielding many more AOS awards than Deus itself. When I asked Scott Mitamura about his current breeding of white Cattleyas, he said that he's trying to develop more of these Brasso whites using Deus and Deus hybrids. Scott is trying to bring us more vigorous whites that can bloom twice a year. He said that he is having some success. I hope he will bring them out for judging so we can enjoy some new award-winning white cat layers. What I really saw a lot of in the recently awarded white Cattleyas was good clones of species. Some really beautiful plants, but there are too many to show and talk about here, let alone properly study. So I've just included a few. Within the purview of the unifoliate Cattleyas, there were Cattleya trianii and Cattleya ludemanniana. Cattleya warzowitzii and the Schroederi, as well as Unifoliates Genmanii and Maxima, which are not pictured here. There were other awards to excellent white forms of Cattleya species, including Walkeriana, Yangiana, Nobiliar, and Intermedia, as well as Guarianth Skinneri, which I still think of as a Cattleya, although I need to get over that. There were some interesting white awarded that were outside the main purview of this talk, including that natural hybrid between Lodigesia and Wakriana called Cattleya X Delosa, and some nice hybrids with pure white Catalotonia. Maybe some of these are the trends of the future. Finally, Hawaii has its own storied history of award-winning white Cattleyas. When I asked Ben Kojama Jr. and Scott Mitamura about Hawaii's best white Cattleyas, Cattleya Princess Bells was the first one they both mentioned. Princess Bells received an astonishing 28 awards from the American Orchid Society, including 20 right here on Oahu and one in Hilo, as well as awards from other orchid societies around the world. It was originated by Harold M. Kushima of Eva Beach and one of Mr. Kushima's plants, Princess Bell Harold, was the first one awarded at the Kunia Flower Show in 1959. He went on to receive awards for four of his plants, including Betty's Bouquet, which is shown here on the left. I imagine that Mr. Kushima was either a very generous friend or a very enterprising orchid vendor because 13 other growers on Oahu displayed award-winning plants, including two awards to Baldomero Barcina, Dennis Tomiyasu, and Masato Yamada. Other local awardees included orchid luminaries like Milton Warren and Edward Wong, who of course named his beautiful princess bells after Williette. Princess Bells is a cross between Cattleya Empress Bells and Cattleya Bob Bats, both of which had Cattleya Bow Bells as the pod parent or mother plant. So we can see the enduring influence of Bow Bells even here in Hawaii. Cattleya Princess Bells is the parent, grandparent, or great grandparent of over 600 new crosses that have been awarded over 300 times so far. Many Hawaii nurseries, including Kodama, h &R, Richard Takafuji of the Orchid Center, and Puanani produced award-winning crosses using princess bells. 
The Kodama Orchid Nursery used Princess Bells as the pod parent for this lovely Inez Okimoto. And I just couldn't resist showing the beautiful Rinkolelio Catleo Hawaiian effects, which Kodama registered in 2001, with Princess Bells in it three generations back. Just a little reminder that white Catleas don't always breed white. And I am happy to report that HOS members are still growing and enjoying award-winning white Catleas, even if we did not personally receive the awards. I asked Jocelyn Mokalehua if I could share her fabulous Rinkolelia Catlea Donna Kimura Asa this evening. This plant was awarded an AM from the AOS as grown by her dad, Hiroshi Kojima, in 1997. Eva Orchid Society was his home club and he was one of the last original members when he passed in 2014 at the age of 94. Like many of us, he was a hobbyist, but he provided some of his flowers to Leeward Florist and he helped Kenny Barra sell orchids back to the time when the Cunea show was up in Cunea. Katlea Donna Kimura Asa was previously awarded an AM by HOS as grown by Ben Kodama Sr. As many of you know better than me, Ben Sr. was the consummate orchid professional, grower, hybridizer, orchid society president, orchid judge emeritus, and so much more. Ben Sr. passed on in 2017 at the age of 92, but before he left us, he was awarded both the silver medal and the gold medal by the American Orchid Society, and he left his indelible mark on the orchid world. Rinkolilio Catlea Donna Kimura was originated by the Kodama Orchid Nursery in 1970. Its pod parent was none other than Princess Bells. On the right is my Catlea as Bets Diane. This picture was taken on October 12th of last year. So I'm hoping I can bring this plant to an HOS show sometime in the future. Catlea Esbets was originated in 1956 by another of Hawaii's renowned orchid growers and hybridizers, Roy Fukumura of Maui. Mr. Fukumura is possibly best known for Vanda Yipsum, Yipsumwa, which has the most flower quality awards of any Vanda hybrid in the AOS judging system's history. Mr. Fukumura himself was awarded a silver medal by the American Orchid Society for his contributions to the orchid world. And he died on Maui in 2003 at the age of 96. Catlea as Betts Diane received its award of merit in Hilo in 1971 when exhibited by Dr. T.D. Wu. I obtained a division of the plant from Ben Oliveros of Orchid Eros when he joined us at HOS's 75th anniversary show in 2019. I wanted to close with this September 2020 picture Matthias sent me of himself and his bow bells white sands for two reasons. One, it just makes me smile and it takes me right back to the wonder of these amazing plants. But perhaps more importantly, I'm very grateful for people like Matthias and Ben Oliveris and Roy Tokunaga, Scott Mitamura, and all those who carry forward the spark of Clint McDade, Bill Bracey, Ernest Hetherington, Ben Kodama, Roy Fukumura, and countless others. Thank you. That's, I'd be happy to take any questions. Great job, Kate. Thank you. Come on now, we all want our plants to look like Matthias's, right? <laughs> so Matthias, what is that giant white cat layer behind you in your picture? Now turn your, turn your mic on. Yes, um, 
Those are my own breeding line, and this is uh, Bob Betts by Ruth G, and I register Ooh. it as uh, White Diamonds. So I got two different ones here, so you see the outcome is quite different. Um, some come out fuller, some come out a little bit more, um, like this guy here. I really like that one. You can see that my lighting here is not the best one. I kind of like this guy. It's pretty nice. flat, has nice, uh, three nice flowers. Uh, they're not very full on this flowering. Um, it varies literally from one flowering to the other. And I just repotted this one last year, and it usually takes two years uh, for the plant to establish itself really well and then bloom good. There's the other one that I have here, it's still in the five inch pot, and it bloomed much better and much bigger. I mean, the flower is so beautiful and full. I mean, this is like the classic pop beds offspring. I mean, you can see all the pictures that you have shown before. This is a typical pop beds. Um, gorgeous. Yeah, Thank it's you. A really gorgeous thing. I love lights. Then the other white that's there, that's, um, yeah, that's kind of, um, you know, I got the Spring Climax, which is a really wonderful uh, white, and I did a selfie, and this is one of the first one that bloomed. So it's not the best shape on this one, but it's one of the first ones that's, that is flowery. So the lip is a little bit elongated. Um, but what I like about Spring Climax, and what I wanted to uh, keep um, breeding with it, and I did actually uh, did two other um, classes with it, is that it has an exceptionally, I don't know if you guys can see that, but it has an exceptionally strong stem. So there's never any staking involved or anything. The flowers hold up really well above the foliage, and um, they're really thick from their substance, which is a big plus with the whites, because when you go to bow belts, they are kind of thin from the substance. So mm. In Hawaii weather with all humidity, the flower opens and you have a two days, two days um, beautiful and then the spots come from the fungus. So the thicker the substance, the longer they will be beautiful in my opinion. So um, that's why I like the, the, the spring climax. Well, as Calvin Kamana would tell you, uh, one of my weaknesses as a grower is staking. So anything that doesn't need to be staked is, uh, is it's good. Winner. Is a winner. All right. Well, Br Brad, maybe I should turn it back to you. Okay. Are there? Thank you very much, Kate. Very informative, and it's great looking at all of those beautiful pictures and uh, awarded plants. Um, Mel, did you have any questions? <laughs> Oh, it was just an excellent presentation. I, she's oh, she overwhelmed me. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific job. Oh, thank well, there's you. There's a tremendous, tremendous history. Um, certainly, it's possible to grow excellent white catalias in Hawaii. We have the environment, and then hopefully, we can keep those lines popular and and very. Uh, much in the mix for all of the plants that we grow. Um, thank you. Thank you again, Kate. Well, th thank you for inviting me, Brad. I do Is it want cooler weather? Oh, sorry. Go, go ahead. Don't they need mist in cooler weather? Well, you know, there's, there's, better growers on this call than me, but but I would say that um, most standard white cat layers do pretty well um, with bright conditions. Um, in, in my very humble opinion, uh, the worst you can do is overwater them. I, I, I think, um, you know, is some people in HOS know I grow a bunch of phragmopediums and and if you're looking at a Phragmopedium, you should water it. If you're looking at a Cattleya, wondering if you should water it, you probably shouldn't. That's that's my rule. Um, you know, I, I I don't know that you need um, to be 
yeah, it was cold. Although Matthias, maybe he's proven me wrong on that. Matthias, is it cold where you're where you're at? You see this, Richard? I have on it's freezing. <laughs> <laughs> it's so cold this winter. I don't know what's happening. It's way too cold. I just, I'm sorry. I just thought they were the ones that grew so well out in the avenues in San Francisco, which is cold and misty. They do get sun, though. Just not when you're home, usually. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I have an unheated greenhouse in Daly City. And during the winter months, I don't water my cat layers for about two months, sometimes three. Yeah, I taught in Daly City, so I know what your weather's like. <laughs> I can remember telling the kids, let's go look at the ocean. What ocean? Because <laughs> of the fog. Like, yep. it's sunny today, let's go look. <laughs> yeah. So Dennis, when you um, don't water for three months, under the bulbs all shriveled up? No, because we have, our winters are cold and moist. So of course, orchids would absorb moisture from the air. So I have uh, large bark clay pots, some of them, that, those that need to dry out a lot more. And those that uh, need more moisture, I have it in plastic pots. So uh, it varies. And, and you have to listen to your plants. You know, not all of them will grow the same way. So uh, it's like children, you, you, know, the, you know, one needs special care and the other doesn't. <laughs> so most of the time I ignore most of my plants. <laughs> Yeah, Dennis, by the way, has some beautifully grown plants that he always posts on Facebook. I got to send Jan more so that she can post it uh, in your bulletin. All right. Are there any other questions for Kate? I'll just throw one other thing out that I didn't include my talk because you, you know, I, it, it didn't seem quite right to me, but it was intriguing. Um, I, I read a couple of sources that um, suggested that Bow Bells was used in Queen Elizabeth, then Princess Elizabeth's wedding bouquet in 1941. And the reason people thought it might have been Bow Bells, and there's a there's a picture of a beautiful bouquet of her beautiful bouquet. Actually, there was two made, but there's a picture. Um, but I don't think it was Bow Bells because I think. It, and by the way, um, it was reported that Clint McDade provided the Catleas from his nursery in England. For the for the Catleas, but no one ever knew exactly what they were by the time they were asking the question. But I don't think they were bow bells because if Clint McDade had you know fabulous bow bells in 1941, I think he would have showed them to the judges before 1945. So I I, I speculated it was Suzanne High or one of you know one of those other great. Uh, crosses one of those great hybrids used to make bow bells but I, I didn't think it was bow bells so I didn't uh, in, include it in my it was an outtake but an interesting story all right thank you again Kate I do hey Kate go ahead sorry it's Tanya um aren't all the first ladies uh Catleas are also white Yes, and, and in fact, um, Arthur Chadwick has, uh, of Chadwick and Sons, he, um, he has, if you go to their website, um, uh, he has lots of blogs about them, and um, yeah, yeah and, and, and in fact, he sent me pictures, I only, I only put that one in the talk, that's not my grandmother, but it, it reminded me of her corsages, and um, and, uh, but, but he has, uh, when I emailed him and asked him for a picture of orchid corsages, he said, I have thousands, how many do you want? And I said, mm, just a couple, but, uh, but yes, the f first ladies all wore um, wonderful orchid corsages, usually white, some of them were semi albos, but, um, but uh, they, they, I mean, they were giant things. I mean, we just, uh, modern women just can't pull it off, I don't think. We would be embarrassed to wear something that 
you know huge on our lapel but but they're they're pretty fun um i i, I wish i could pull it off <laughs> you, you'd never see yeah, they also the name after them right right yeah you, you never see okay. Eleanor Roosevelt without a corsage. Exactly. Yeah. And, and she and always they, had a corsage. Kate, um, Queen Elizabeth, they got married in November of 1947. I thought it was 41. No, because I know 47? she was in Canada then. Oh. They sent her for safekeeping because of the war. Okay. Well, you know, that's a, that's another. Yeah, I, I couldn't really pin down a, a good source, but. Um, then maybe it makes maybe it's more possible because the one of the articles I read and it was um, you know it was just something somebody you know uh, I forget which it was so I don't want to I don't want to say the wrong thing but it I believe it said 1941 and I'm like mm, that didn't make sense but if it was 47 it could have yeah. been that's no, that's yeah, kind of no. cool. November 20th, 1947. Sorry, I was a history major, so I've got- Oh, no, that's good, see? 